Well, I have also the pleasure of moderating this panel. So my uh, advisory board now have to really look at me, make sure I behave myself. So this is, your job starts now. Um, as an academic, I have to start from the left and introduce everybody this way. So. <clears throat> To your left, but to my right, so I have it both ways, <laughs> is Mr. Jordan Rash, uh, Conservation Director of Forterra, based here in Tacoma, leads Forterra's cons conservation projects in the South Sound and the Southern Olympic Peninsula. Forterra works to conserve working lands, create parks, improve resiliency to climate change, and protect critical habitats. Jordan previously served on the executive staff of Washington's Commissioner of Public Land, Peter Goldmark, as well as for state legislators in Oregon and Washington. Lauren Flemister, senior planner, urban designer, city... Uh oh so that's my first misbehaving. <laughs> Urban designer, city of Auburn. Lawrence focuses on the downtown revitalization and the strategic development of a stronger spatial, visual, and cultural identity for the city of Auburn and how the intersection of design, economy, land use, political will, and culture, <clears throat> and culture affect the evolution of cities. She previously worked for HOK, United Nations Habitat, the city of Austin, and the Environmental Defense Fund. She is actually one of my bosses, and so she is also on our advisory board. Mark Henshaw, principal planner, Walker Macy. Mark heads staff of planners, architects, and urban designers, developing plans for a wide range of, uh, of, poli uh, of policies, programs, and projects in cities and towns throughout the Pacific Northwest. His work includes downtown plans, corridor plans, master plans for town centers, gateway and civic centers, urban parks, and transit-oriented development sites. His recent book, True Urbanism, predicted the recent and escalating rediscovery of city centers as good places to, li to, to live. Pig Staley, the famous last name for us in academia. <laughs> PLA, FASLA, uh, she's a landscape architect, so there's an affinity there. So, principal SVR design with a focus on planning, designing, and sustaining environments that support with human development and active lifestyle. PEG's work includes green infrastructure, complete streets, accessibility, utility systems, urban forestry, parks, and site design. She also brings a comprehensive understanding of the, of the issue, uh, of the larger issue of public infrastructure projects, uh, from funding to equity and operation and maintenance. I'm excited to have him here. The order of the, present, uh, the introduction is the order of presentation. For the rest of the day, this is what we are going to be doing. Five to seven minutes, they will present. I will throw a couple of questions at them while you think about how you want to ask your questions, and there we're going to have a dialogue for the rest of the time. So with that, Jordan, take it away. Great. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you again for having me, and of course, to our host, the University of Washington here in Tacoma. Uh, my name is Jordan Rash. I'm the conservation director for Forterra, based here in Tacoma. I cover our organization's conservation transactions, uh, basically, south of I-90 and west of the Cascades. So majority of my work happens to be here in Pierce County, uh, but I also uh, go all the way out to Willapa Bay in, in Grace Harbor. Uh, so I'm going to keep this very short because this is really supposed to be more of a panel discussion and answer questions that you might have. But I, I really want to kind of touch on the work that we do and how that creates a more livable region. So yeah, here we go. So what does it mean when I say Forterra is conserving places like farms and, and forests and habitat areas, et cetera? Uh, effectively, we work with landowners to conserve their lands to keep them from being converted into this. And this is a development pattern that we've seen uh, in the Puget Sound region you know, for basically the last 60 years. And I want to go back just to point out what kind of the, the differences are. Uh, and you can see Tacoma's there in the distance with, on Commencement Bay. Um, and this is the area between Puyallup and Fife and farmland. Uh, and, you know, so this kind of growth if, will continue unless we, the community and its leaders, uh, step up to demand something better. There we go. 
So how does Forterra conserve lands? Uh, so if you own property, you own rights that come along with it, you know, access, timber, uh, development rights, uh, for example. And so to illustrate how this functions when we conserve property, think of your property as a bundle of sticks, sticks with each right within that, or each stick representing a right within that bundle. So when we buy a conservation easement, which is a tool to conserve pieces of property, we're really just buying one of your sticks from that bundle, most typically your right to develop, so your development stick. Uh, so when we buy that development right, or those development rights, uh, you're left with property that you can still use and enjoy, but you will no longer be able to develop it. That's just one of the tools in our toolbox that we use to conserve property. Uh, and when we utilize this tool to prevent development from creeping into areas with sensitive habitats or with uh, critical working lands, uh, but strictly conserving farms, forests, and salmon habitat alone uh, will not foster livability in our communities. So let's take a look at the urban environment and uh, this is actually a bit of a preview of what you would see in Gene's presentation in April. So I stole his slide. It's because it's a good one for demonstrating how our work in the urban area and how the, our work in the rural areas are connected. So let's, uh, this image can be really any community in the region. And we have all seen streetscapes that look just like this, right? To me, this looks a lot like Sumner when I, when I see this picture. I don't know, anyone kind of been down Main Street in Sumner? Raise a hands. Yeah, a number of you. To me, this looks like Sumner. I don't know if anybody else is getting that besides me. But the Puget Sound Regional Council estimates that the four county region, King, Pierce, Kitsap, uh, and Snohomish counties, will grow by more than one million people over the next 25 years. And if we do not plan for that growth and, and provide services and infrastructure, such as transportation, schools, food systems, parks, and open space, then we can end up in a place that looks more like this. And I'd be willing to wager that the majority of the folks in this room don't want to see this. People that are stuck in traffic, people that are having to commute for two hours to get to their job, uh, people that are disconnected from um, the uh, wildlife habitat and open spaces that they enjoy. Uh, and it, the environment in, in itself isn't all that great. You know, air pollution, water quality problems, things like that. So. If we plan for growth, that growth now, that, that growth that's going to occur over the next 25 years, we can develop in a way that keeps the cost of living down, provides transportation choices, uh, allows consumers to access local grown produce, and connects us to cherished spaces like Mount Rainier National Park, the Foothills Trail, Point Defiance, and the Puyallup River. Uh, so when we talk to people from across the region, they tell us that uh, is, that is how they want their community to grow and how important these attributes are to the quality of life uh, and why they choose to live here. Fratera's role is uh, really in delivering on this vision and is primar primarily driven through innovative programs such as the regional transfer development rights market, tax increment financing, stewardship of public open space, and land banking of property uh, to be developed for community use in the years ahead. So that's a very quick overview of how our work uh, creates a more livable region. Uh, and that's across communities from Tacoma all the way out to Carbonado and Aberdeen to uh, Buckley. You know, we really run the gamut. And it, it's, livability is more than just livability in our urban areas like Tacoma and Seattle. It's really about livability in the, our rural communities as well, especially those that have been hit hard uh, by the downturn in natural resource economies. And Forterra is working with them to, to, under, to kind of reinvent themselves from being strictly timber towns into something more and help them to sustain themselves. Uh, because if all we're doing is investing in our rural lands and conserving working farms and forests, which is great, but if we're, that's all we do and we ignore what's going on in our communities, whether they're in Tacoma or in Wilkeson or Carbonate or wherever, then we're not gonna create a more livable region. So. That, that's what I want to leave you with, and I look forward to your questions as we get further along. Okay. Okay, good morning. As Ellie uh, introduced me, I'm Lauren Flemister, work for the city of Auburn. I'm going to be talking about um, what really my job comes down to, which is competing for uniqueness in the region. Um, I'm from a, I don't want to say small, but I would, I would say medium sized. <laughs> um, Size jurisdiction in Auburn, um, originally a rail um, and agricultural town. 
It's now grown to almost 80,000 people. And so as the economy has changed, um, we have some challenges to kind of uh, continue to grow and develop and, and stay diverse. So um, what are we competing for? Um, some of it is grant dollars. Some of it is boutique businesses, uh, regional buzz, um, and higher earning residents. Um, obviously, the considerations of tax base, um, a diverse economy, uh, bringing in tourism dollars, um, and obviously, part of the way you do that is through placemaking and solid infrastructure. Um, and sort of, like in all fields, things become trendy. Um, and I think some of the tools that we're seeing uh, planning departments all over the country using our um, you know, firm-based design to create that big, sexy plan, right? That, that streetscape, or um, you're also seeing community-led design efforts. Um, I think um, both of those are, can be really hit or miss, um, particularly in community-led design, having an engaged community and keeping an engaged community is a challenge that all planners dread. Um, economic development programming, um, I'll get into that a little bit more, but that's everything from um, you know, business assistance, helping folks write business plans, to facade improvement programs, um, tenant improvement, um, fitting out programs, things like that. And business recruitment, um, that one's, you know, that's not new, but it's, I think, because there's so much competition for specific kinds of business, particularly in historic downtowns, it's become uh, even more competitive. So some of the things that we're doing in Auburn are, you know, like I said, these um, economic development workshops. So, you know, we have things like helping people, you know, figure out how to tweet, um, to, um, you know, writing a business plan, to how do you start a successful restaurant. Um, then, of course, master planning. Um, this is a park that we have um, that Burger. Um, uh, worked on. It's a, a park um, that's actually kind of a destination park, so that's good for us on that, that people are coming from other places to attend this park, but working on making it um, safer, more cohesive with the other amenities in the area. Um, and then streetscape design. This is going to look familiar to PEG. Um, MIGSVR is working on this for us, um, but obviously, um, Part of what makes a downtown attractive um, is your streetscape, obviously your businesses, um, and everyone's always trying to figure out, do you do the streetscape first, or do you try to get the great businesses in first? Um, and this is a facade improvement grant program um, that we started, that I started last year, um, to interesting um, results, but it's, it's going okay. Um, <laughs> so, what does success? What does success mean? Let's assume that you're you're winning the 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 competition amongst your neighboring jurisdictions. What does that mean? Um, so obviously, it means economic development, diverse, uh, diversification. It means regional status. You become a regional draw, but it also means you've become more expensive and you're displacing people and businesses. Gentrification, right? <laughs> um, so. This is not a new problem. I actually found um, a 1907 Tacoma Times. I don't know if you guys, yeah, I think you can see. So this guy's getting beat up because the cost of living is rising. This is 1907. So the question is, can every city be special? And I wanna add the bullets that are not on this slide, which is can you be special and can you be affordable and can you be inclusive? You know, are there limitless cool people doing and making cool things, right? <laughs> Is there limitless historical relevance? Is there limitless creative and artistic energy? Is there limitless public space as destination? So is every single city going to have a place that's going to be a destination? So I think part of it is being proactive. And 
I've had, I'm starting to have this conversation more and more. You kind of have to start doing stuff when you still haven't, you know, shaken off the stink of being an undesirable. So that means you have to create affordable housing when you still have substandard market rate housing in your market. Um, economic development um, has to interface with small and large businesses and developers. So it's great if you bring in, you know, a Boeing plant, but what is on your main street? Um, and another huge, another huge tool um, that I think some cities haven't been willing to do is be brokers and developers. So sometimes you have to grab land when it's cheap and then you pick the developer that you want. Or sometimes you have to help the business find the right space to be in. In communication um, and education, I think part of that is um, only using the big plan instead of focusing on um, community buy-in and community-initiated efforts. Um, that's really huge and it's really hard to do, and I think that's a big part of the reason more people don't do it successfully. Um, and then developing relationships with and educating property owners. They dictate a lot of who you have in your spaces that creates your draw. And if they're not savvy, they're not educated, they're not interested, it ends up creating pretty large problems. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Well, good morning, and thank you uh, for inviting me, Ali. Um, the bio that was read didn't uh, tell uh, you that I also have a dual appointment. Um, not only am I with Walker Macy Landscape Architects, but I'm also the chief urban designer for the Seattle Housing Authority uh, for the redevelopment of Yesler Terrace, um, which some of you may be familiar with. And I'll mention that a little later in the presentation. But um, it's been interesting for me to come back um, to Tacoma from time to time in my career because I've touched this place at various points in my career from the Tacoma Dome era when that was first considered um, to the South Tacoma Way uh, planning effort that was going on a number of decades ago and to finally leading uh, the downtown plan that was put in place 15 years ago that has, um, as I've watched it, led to a lot of really interesting, fascinating redevelopment of this urban center. And then finally, more recently, with the design of Pacific um, Street, uh, particularly North End, where the nightlife is, the over you can thank me or blame me for the overhead lights that are, are there. Um, so um, I, what I wanted to talk about was one particular aspect, because this is such a broad this is such an uh, amazingly broad subject, as Ali mentioned, um, but to zero in on one particular aspect, and that is the important role of public space. And this is what really does make a difference in communities. We can't just be talking about density or transportation improvements or infrastructure or economic development. All of those are absolutely, obviously important but until we grab a hold of this and make sure that we shepherd it and we nurture it and we care for it and we create places that people want to come together and enjoy themselves individually and collectively, uh, we've really failed. So we have to put a huge amount of emphasis on how we get various forms of open space, public space, green space within our uh, emerging and more uh, densifying communities. Whether they're the classic green that we we used to put in place a hundred years ago, we have a long tradition of those kind of classic spaces, to public markets, and many communities have these now, but it's, it's, re it, it's a vivid illustration of how people really enjoy this kind of social interaction where they get to see the people producing products they get to interact with folks socially. They get to have experiences, and their lives are richer for that kind of exchange. It's sort of the best part of American capitalism is that small-scale, entrepreneurial, creative, direct, face-to-face -face interaction. And that's what we're all about. We love that stuff. We've just been denied it for 50 years, and we're now rediscovering what is really truly in our roots. We had a much longer tradition of this kind of public space, civic space, and we just didn't do it for 50 years. And so we forgot, 
two generations of time, we forgot really how to do it. Now we're relearning how to create these kinds of environments for everyone to enjoy. The rise of street food, phenomenal, across the country, just sweeping the country, food trucks, food carts, those kinds of handcrafted, healthy uh, choices that people have on a whim. And actually, you may have been following this, there's a, now an interesting intersection, speaking of tweets, that millennial folks will tell each other where those food trucks are by tweeting. And then instantly there's a line of 30 people at that, at that particular favored truck. And so this intersection of hand crafting and high technology is really a, it's just a, a great kind of um, trend. Um, this notion of shared public living rooms. Um, I use this word all the time, I'm sure Peg does too. Um, but this notion of people coming together and enjoying space as a group and having random encounters that just sort of add to your daily life. A really important thing, I, one of my theories um, that Peg may disagree with, but one of my theories is that we had a great civic parks movement that goes back hundreds of years from the Boston Common to Central Park in New York to the Olmsted Brothers legacy here. It was pure civic space. And at a particular point in time that path was ruined by the recreation movement that just said all parks had to be ball fields, programmed recreation, all sorts of things that you were forced to do. You had to organize yourselves. You have to schedule things. You have to, it was sort of part of our kind of almost Puritan work ethic that you had to be always doing something to keep, keep yourself out of trouble. In fact, literally, there was a part of the, that movement that was about keeping the working masses organized and out of, out of criminal activity kind of a dark part of our, our history. But we're now realizing how important this is to our lives is these kinds of spaces being available everywhere. I would like to say that every city needs a destination place. And not only that, but every neighborhood in every city needs the destination spot. Not necessarily for people outside the, not tourist destinations, but for people that live there. And if you make a place great for people that live there, other people want to enjoy it. You don't have to do the opposite. You don't have to program space for tourists. That's sort of, I think, an ugly side of our planning. But program it for people that live there and what their needs are and make that work. And other people will discover it, and that's even better. Um, this kind of notion of urban play, we don't have to have playground structures. We don't have to have these kind of dedicated, single purpose places where they're only for certain age groups. Just let that kind of random stuff happen where adults are participating, kids are participating, lots of different ages, different times of the day. Um, things sometimes, the, in this case, the fountain is off and it's for musical events or concerts or other uh, speeches or that kind of ceremonies that, where it's a multi-purpose, flexible, ever-changing, unpredictable place that you, you, every time you go there, something different will be happening. And the urban play is by everyone. Everybody's sort of exercising themselves. It's, it's part of sort of the total thing that you're doing throughout that period of your day. The importance of activating the edges of streets, absolutely key, making sure, it doesn't mean retail has to be everywhere. There's lots of ways of activating street edges, but that shared public living room that exists in every city, that linear public living room, and I call it the first 30 feet horizontal, sort of from the building face out in the first 30 feet vertical. It's where you can touch it, you can see it, you can experience it. It's visceral, it's live. You see signs, you see products, you see people, you see dogs, you see people drinking things, you see all sorts of stuff close at hand, and you enjoy it in a very basic, primal, personal level. It's a very personalized experience. And that envelope of space absolutely needs to be guided. So um, there are some other examples of shared public spaces and how families maybe are rethinking whether things have to even be green um, and the drama and delight that you can get in public spaces that's unexpected. Play without playgrounds, I mentioned that earlier. And then just briefly, my, the other hat that I have, this is a grand social experiment that Peg's firm is involved in where we are taking the old public housing project built 60 years ago, totally reconstructing it. In a breathtaking way, it will go from 1,200 people that have lived there for 70 years to 12,000 people, I think, within a decade. We're creating a whole new urban neighborhood that has a full range of incomes from zero to what the market can bear, all living together in an in a integrated community, 
around a central green uh, with green streets and opportunities for people to do all of the things that I mentioned earlier within this community. It's, it's a huge social experiment. It's a huge economic experiment. It's a huge physical planning experiment. Um, and I see it evolving in a way that's just absolutely fascinating. Um, so just to send, this is the, the design for the Central Park that Site Workshop um, developed. But it brings everybody together with lots and lots of choices whether they want to enjoy the space individually, collectively, or in groups. So thank you. So again, I'm Peg Staley. I am a native of Tacoma, and most of my large family that we discussed <laughs> lives here. So livability, how we as people interact and build relationships, how we treat, how we repair, and how we maintain our common environment. And that's really important to me. This is a street I walked down many, many years. We walked a lot. And I went to school. I visited friends. And this is what it looks like now. And for me, it evokes great memories. And I feel good. And I want everyone else to feel good when they walk down their streets. So, livability. What do people want? They want scale. They want places that work for them. They want transportation. They want the gathering spaces. But they really just want to feel good about where they live, where they choose to live. So, when we as designers look at places, what I like and what we want to focus on is improving those very, very simple everyday places. It's everything, but improving them so it fits to the place where they are. I also feel like the comfort issue is really important. Let me see if I missed there. So, you know, when people of different ages, when you're young and you, you're eight and your parents say, yes, you can go walk around the block, are they comfortable? When you have young children and you're walking with them, are you comfortable when your two-year-old takes away from you? Are you comfortable when you're out at night hanging out on a street? How do you make yourself feel comfortable? And then do you continue that comfort so that when you are 80, you're willing to walk out your door, that you feel safe. So that's important to me. It's what Mark was talking about. How do we get these common places to feel good for people? So walking, walking around, what we do when we walk around. Everyone walks differently, and everyone walks differently at various times. And I was walking the other day, and I, I always walk on this street, and I saw something I had never seen for 30 years. So, you know, it's just that op the chance, that opportunity that we provide of the finest detail, whether it's you planting a new t you know, tulip bulb or daffodils in your yard, or a bench that the city decides every couple hundred feet so that somebody can sit. It's the opportunity for us to engage. When we take those places, these, the main streets, and add a bit more detail, we're creating more opportunity. The opportunities to interact with the businesses, the opportunities to meet our friends, to engage, and to just walk along and know that the weather has changed and we have flowers. So we're shifting. Mark talked about that. Lauren talked about Forterra's really setting examples across our our, our smaller cities and our, um, you know, the rural, and they're rural cities, they're not just rural places. And the, we're now looking and we're saying, all right, we have a lot of space. We just weren't using it appropriately. 
We make tight little changes. We think of investments, we take bleak places and we start to make them better. When we make them better, we give places for all ages to engage and we're not afraid of the teenagers hanging out. So the other part, and, and I guess, you know, there's a lot of talk about the living room, but I grew up with a really big family and we all played in everyone's backyards. And so that isn't available now. We're not gonna have these, all those big spaces. So we need, we do need some of these typical little playgrounds or, or spots visible for people when they're walking along to see other people playing, other people sitting. So we go, oh wow, look at them, look what they're doing. What food are they eating? What's that game they're playing? So that we interact with all of us. We also need to respect our infrastructure. And we're learning that. We're learning to address our environment, our street environment, so that it is more than just vehicles that we're dealing with, our, our habitat, our tree canopy, our safe, so we can cross these streets and deal with, with the stormwater that we've created by our pavement. We are all looking at ways to change these special places and make them competitive. Um, I, you know, I look at South Tacoma Way and I still see South Tacoma Way from this odd perspective of when I was about four years old picking up flowers at the florist shop on the corner with my mom and the scale is so different now. And then in the 70s they made this improvement but it, it was missing something and it's something Tacoma's looking at again and Auburn and Seattle and Kent and you know everywhere is how do we make these places feel? How do people feel when they're there? Why would they stop? Because really what we wanna do is just every once in a while when we're walking along, when we're going across to stop and to think. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you for starting the conversation for us and great uh, ideas to think about. Um, I'm going to ask the macro question and you get to ask all the detailed questions. We have mics here and they can be run, but if you wanna just walk to them, that would be great as well. Either way it would work. Um, so every time there's a conversation about livability, what strikes me the most, especially when we talk about design and we talk about planning, is the level of nostalgia language that's in it. We always are yearning for something we lost. There's a, there's a narrative of loss, we call it, in livability discussions. But at the same time, we want something that we have, would have never thought about 100 years ago. So the question to you that Lauren started it, so I'm going to sort of bring it back into that. All these great ideas that we are talking about, there's the issue of affordability and housing affordability. And I'm looking at Michael Mara and I'm thinking to myself, if he is going to be looking for affordable housing policy from the city, which we are, right? Uh, and we are hoping that it will work out. How do you create that and make it affordable so livability by itself does not always become the narrow streets, the same kind of look, everything, but in fact, it makes life easier for people so they can enjoy the public space that Mark's talking about, that they can't see the results that Jordan is talking about and everything else in between. How do we bring money into this? Because money isn't it. Um, well, it's a big topic. Yeah, well, make it <laughs> uh, But I'll take a crack at it in a couple of different ways. Um, one is we tend to talk about affordability uh, just in the housing dimension. And I think while that's obviously important, and there are a number of tools that we can use from inclusionary zoning to bonus uh, zoning to um, public investments to tax levies to, I mean, there's a whole host of things that we have available to us to do that, and we need to be good at and sharp at using those tools. There's another thing that is now not in, on the table, and that is how to have affordable spaces for small, homegrown, locally owned businesses, because they are disappearing. They're being pushed out by the larger 
more credit tenants that brokers like to do deals on. And we've got to reverse that. That is one of our great traditions in this country is allowing for small scale capitalism to flourish. And we're just letting small businesses twist in the wind. And I think this is, a, this is a, a ripe subject for local governments to get involved in and to make sure that they can keep the people that they've got now, they're doing well, and nurture new people to come into these destinations and, and start up and expand and make even a better set of, of business um, prospects. We're just not doing any of that, or at least very few people are doing any, anything about that. And, but I think there are similar tools available. We can do some strategic public investments. We can, I mean, one of my favorite ideas this uh, day and age is that there are lots of larger tenant spaces that are vacant because the bigger businesses aren't, the furniture stores and stuff are going away. Well, a city could either buy or take the master lease for that space, break it up into smaller units, and then make them available to those startup retail businesses. No, I'm not aware of anybody doing that. But I think it could be done and fairly easy and, and pass the test of constitutional law. But that's just one one thing. So I don't want to thank you. Go on. Thank you. Anybody else wants to? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll I'll touch on a couple things about affordability. Uh, I, I, this is my second presentation of the day. I had one this morning uh, in Silicon, which is how, why I was only five minutes early to this one. Um, and I, there's a really great slide, and I wish I had more time to show it, but it, it, it's of the Puget Sound region, specifically kind of a focus on this area, Pierce County. And it shows a map of what, it, what the development patterns look like now and the open space that you can see and what it would look like in 90 years if we basically allowed the base zoning to play out and you get the development into farms, into forests, and that kind of thing. So what you see is basically rural sprawl all the way out towards you know, basically Mount Rainier uh, on our, what's called the Kapowson tree farm. So when you talk about affordability, uh, what Mark was just saying about, it's not just about affordability of housing. I mean, if you buy your, you know, $200,000 $200, house on what is now the Kapowson tree farm, and you have to commute, if you're lucky, three hours a day, that's taking up a lot of value that you'd be, that you're saving by building on this, you know, 80 acre property, because that's what the zoning would allow, out in uh, far east Pierce County. So transportation is a major component to that. And so if you're just continuing to build out, you're not, you're not gonna capture very many, or very much savings by having to commute that far. And I'll, I, because I work so much with, with farmland and doing farmland conservation projects, uh, we, we don't produce that much food locally, in, like in the grand scheme of things. It's only a few percent, right? But if you develop, let's just say, half of our remaining farmland, you go from about 50,000, roughly, acres of farmland in Pierce County down to, say, 25,000, now your capacity gets cut in half, and that ability to provide local produce uh, which is usually uh, you know, much more healthy. It's grown in smaller farms. It's a different type of management structure than you would get on much larger farms in, say, eastern Washington or in the Midwest. You're, you're losing access to that. And there are already plenty of places in our communities uh, that are effectively food deserts. They don't have access to that local food. So if you're trying to get access to that, that local produce or at least the healthier produce, you're not going to be able to get that if you develop your farmlands. You have to pay more to get that. So there's a, as Mark was saying, there's, it's more than just residential affordability. There's transportation, there's food, I, probably many more than I can think of. But just kind of food for thought, I guess. Thanks. No pun intended. Anybody else want to? Well, I want to get to more questions, but you know, this ties to that is that the project that Mark talked about, we've been working on for um, seven, seven plus years. And so in, in 36 acres, plus or minus, there's $100 million in infrastructure, infrastructure. And so you have to support that by people. And then look at Detroit. So Detroit spread out. They can't afford to maintain the infrastructure. So when affordability, we don't realize that that base thing costs a lot. And we do need to get more dollars out of it. But we, as public people, we also need to kind of own up that we have to pay, probably we need to invest back 
in that infrastructure and it's not inexpensive. So you, we, may ch be per, we may be funding for a, a development like Yesler Terrace or Salishan or redoing a block here or one in Shelton. That, the private parcel is not probably going to be affording that. We as the public need to consider that public infrastructure, public investment. Thank you. But I guess part of the problem too is we always assume that it has to be big infrastructure. We always assume that we need to do these $100 million projects, but think about what you're talking about, like pausing and your nostalgia, right? That could be the smallest improvement. It could be the mm -hmm. tiniest intervention. And I think part of the problem is we do, you know, we do our community engagement, we do our outreach, but I mean, a lot of the time, it's sort of just checking the box on the list, right? Like how engaged and involved is community really in making the determinations about how we spend our money and what improvements we make? We kind of work from the top down in that manner. But the truth is, for a lot of neighborhoods, it would just be, can you pave this one block because we're missing this one stretch of sidewalk? Or can you paint me a crosswalk? Or can I have a piece of public art in this park? And I just think that we're not doing a very good job of honing in on these tiny things that we can do that don't cost a lot of money and that keep us out of these gigantic infrastructure outlays that we can't afford. Thank you. Um, I see someone ready to ask a question. Hi, I just wanted to mention um, a thinker that I think is really important to this discussion and see if you had heard of him. I think in many ways he's considered the father of city and regional planning, Patrick Geddes, um, who lived about over 100 years ago. Um, and uh, he was the mentor of Lewis Mumford and also had a profound impact on Ian McHarg. But he was looking at the Industrial Revolution, the development of cities, um, and the things he came up with, I think, are still ahead of his time. Uh, he worked in India. Uh, during the time of the British Raj, and it was a time when they were putting modern infrastructure into all these historic cities and just blowing them out. And what he did, he called it conservative surgery, is he would go in and understand the cultural and civic and economic history of the place, and then he would do the least destruction to that fabric in inserting the infrastructure. Uh, and, I mean, that's just something that I think we can all appreciate. Um, I think his ideas, he built some of the first affordable housing projects in the world in Glasgow. Um, he had a tremendous effect. He's not as talked about as much in this country like Jane Jacobs, but in some ways he was much more uh, of a powerful and lasting thinker. And I just wanted to see if, uh, if any of you had thought about his work and um, you know, see him in some ways as you know, a, a critical thinker when it, uh, and actually practitioner uh, when it comes to Thank livability. You. Yeah. Thanks. Could I have? Well, I, I think your term um, conservative surgery or the least destruction is, is actually a serious thing we need to look at when we take on um, whether it's putting a new sidewalk in or, you know, planting a new tree or rehabbing buildings and, and areas of what really needs to happen to make to make a change. Um, shoot, I'll, I'll use one of our projects to, as an example. Um, when we started with the city planning um, a park in a street that was funded by the Parks Department, and so it's Bell Street Park, but it's a street, um, everybody wanted high-end materials, um, but those weren't available. The money wasn't there, or chose not to be there. And so really drilled back down into really basic material, really, you know, really basic concrete, scored concrete. What can you do with that? And, and there was a whole a lot of stress and discussion in the office of, wow, that's a drag, this is a drag. We see this happen all the time, but really back to what Lauren is saying is, you know, thinking about really what the purpose of an improvement or a change is, is it, is it for an award? Is it for making this the destination place? Or is it one spot 
that we make a little better with some surgery and you live again for another 50 years. So um, I, I think we need to go back and look at what those early, especially the industrial re re revolution, because we're probably there again in a different way. So we need to go back and draw and see what they've said. Thank and you. So I'm going to ask, we have plenty of time for Q&A, so I don't want to cut anyone short, but it would be very good if we could con make the questions concise, and you can come back for a second question if you wish. <laughs> um, I was just wanting to know whether you're think whether how you're thinking about the aging of the population. The baby boomers are now, the oldest are 65 and over, and the youngest are 50 plus. And as people who have not previously had disabilities tend to be somewhat shocked as they find it's very getting harder and harder to walk across the street, harder and harder to hear or to see something. And it, when you're thinking about urban planning, uh, are you figuring in the changing demographics and the needs? <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, I've written about a lot about that subject um, in various in various forms. But um, what I find really interesting is that you know we have people now living into their 80s, 90s, and hundreds. You're seeing those articles like almost every day now. And but the thing that's interesting is that you, when when we started to move past age 60 or so, we started to deteriorate quickly. I mean, we often died in that decade of, of our 60s. Now we're living decades longer. And so it's, it's opening up lots of needs and possibilities. One is people are working longer, maybe not full time, but they're working longer because they want to contribute. I think all of us want, we don't want to be warehoused like the last generation, our parents or grandparents. That's a horrible prospect to be sent to retirement community in Arizona for Pete's sakes. I mean, to be in a monoculture where you don't see anybody but your Arizona. own <laughs> you know, age group. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's a nightmarish prospect as far as I'm concerned. We don't, we don't, we're not going to buy into that. We want to be part of real communities, real neighborhoods, real streets, see lots of different people, stay active, and not be sort of put out on the ice flow. <clears throat> so uh, I will say um, what is really out there a lot now um, and what what we discuss often is what little things you can do to make it better for someone to, to be able to walk because she, I actually am not big, I'm not a big driver, but my mother was. And you know, going with her when she gave up her car in, with the walker, I learned a lot. My friend is legally blind. I learned a lot walking with them. So. Providing, we are providing, you will see more of this happening. Handrails on our slopes. I mean, good grief. You know, we have steep streets. We, you're going to see them. They're going to be there. Leaning rails. So the other day in our office, somebody said, I want a bench here. I said, the sidewalk's only five feet wide. Well, I want to put a bench here. Well, if someone sits there, they're going to trip someone that's walking along. Well, what can I do? Well, put a, put a rail there. Put something there somebody can lean against. Fire hydrants. Fire hydrants, best thing I learned, I had an 80-year-old neighbor. He would walk 200 feet to the fire hydrant and back every day. He would sit on the fire hydrant. So little tiny things we can do, more benches, more places to just put your hand, things that, you know, the curb ramps may need to be wider, angling out, watch our lighting. Those are things we're all paying attention to. and. There's a lot of internal things, but we are watching that as designers. We are teaching our, our younger people, the people coming in, they have a pretty good basis of empathy. They had a lot of empathy training. Um, so we're teaching them to think, to watch, and hopefully that'll translate to improvements in, in those public spaces. My name is Ulysses Martin. Permaculture Lifestyle Institute, Tech Studios, civil engineer for DOT. Hi, Peg. We did a Tacoma Green Infrastructure Challenge here in the Tacoma last, uh, last year, approximately. And green infrastructure to provide our needs. So green infrastructure to be removed to stormwater. But the question is, in our social experiments and in looking at a social determinant of he community health, what examples besides Yesler and besides uh, the Swan Creek next to Salishan, which I'm involved with, 
a food forest concept, a green infrastructure that feeds people, where people can be included, okay, as empowerment processes to meet young, the individual's question, how can the young come out their door and, and assist with my neighbor's needs in a local setting? Is there any experiments like this going on besides Village Homes Davis, which is about 40 years old in California? Right. Actually, there's a, a, a lot of experiments going on um, with urban, urban agriculture. And I mean, oh, I was on the um, Seattle's pedestrian board and you, you couldn't actually have vegetables growing in the right of way. It wasn't allowed. Um, so that's a few years ago. They had to, pa right, I mean, everyone did it, but <laughs> technically it wasn't approved. So, you know, these are things that um, come along in fruit trees. You couldn't grow fruit trees in the right, right of way because th they drop, right, and they might dent a car or something. So th I would say in the last five years, really, it's blossomed. Um, the thing I want to be careful of is mixing green stormwater infrastructure with growing food or being careful of growing fruit food along our highways. We haven't handled the particulates and the qu water quality. We've got great research happening at Washington State University with the Stormwater Center, but we're not there yet. And so I'm a little, you know, we need to be careful when we double up on our systems. But um, I, I'm seeing a huge push on every project to consider food, whether it's a formal market garden space or a formal urban egg space or an informal plant native plants that have berries. It's pretty consistent. Professor Irena. Hi, um, I have a question for Lauren and then I'd like to open it up for the rest of the panelists. I. Uh, as an architect and planner, I empathize with a comment that you made about how planners dread community engagement. And one of the reasons why I became a professor was to be proactive about that dread in hopefully ending it. And I'm sure that many of my colleagues who are here in the room would love to hear from you as to what you would like to see differently. We are engaging with our community members, our students, and there are tips and advice we can give them about how to be um, productive partners in community engagement. And so if you could tell us, what would you like to see differently? And as I said, one or two comments for the other panelists. Thank you. Um, I think one thing um, that would be a real asset for planners coming up and, and sort of I mean really all planners in practice, is kind of understanding how to engage the community in design processes, so in design efforts um, over a longer period of time. Um, I think community-led design is, um, it really hasn't, I don't think it's really become entrenched and it's really um, rooted itself in, in planning departments yet, but um, I think people are struggling to figure out how to do those kinds of efforts. So let's say you identify a corridor um, and you don't want to do top-down design. You want to have the community tell you what they want and figure out a way to implement it. I, I just don't see um, that there, there are good tools um, um, and good examples to follow on in how to do that successfully. And another thing too is figuring out how to replicate it but customize it to different communities because obviously um, a one size fit all, uh, fits all isn't gonna work because your demographics are different. Your, your, the classes of the communities you're dealing with are gonna be different. And so I think um, that's a big challenge moving forward. I, I can speak to that a little bit too. Uh, in spite of the fact that I'm here speaking in front of you, a lot of times Forterra is brought in to listen. Uh, we, we come into a community, we, we ask people their opinions about a variety of things. Uh, I mean, for example, when we wrote our Cascade Agenda uh, 10 years ago, we hosted a series of conversations called the Cascade Dialogues. And we've reached out to thousands of people over the, starting from the Cascade Dialogues through most recently what we called the Next Way, which was kind of like a 
10 year look back on what we've accomplished as well as where we want, where we want to go over the next 90 years. Uh, and we really try to gauge where what people are looking for, for how they want their community to grow, you know, the kinds of amenities that can be there and, and those kinds of things. Uh, so in, in terms of discrete projects, uh, we do work with communities to help them achieve a vision for like a corridor, for example. Uh, I have two really easy projects that come to mind, and believe it or not, they're, they're not in Seattle or Tacoma. Uh, the first one's in Shelton. We're, we're doing a, a design charrette uh, for like a downtown corridor. corridor. Uh, we're partnering with the city and the, the local chamber. We have a design firm called Methune that's working with us to create this charrette for what their downtown corridor can look like, improve walkability, improve the uh, streetscapes, things like that, to get more people walking, activate more businesses, utilize space that's vacant, and there's a fair amount of vacant space in downtown Shelton. Another really good example where we're this convener, where we're listening to the community, we're, we're trying to gauge their opinion. We, we just launched a, a project in uh, Aberdeen and Hoquiam to create a flood risk master plan to reduce uh, chronic flooding in Aberdeen and Hoquiam. Uh, there's likely to be a combination of new infrastructure, flood control infrastructure, levees, pumps, things like that, but also public open space uh, and some, in a lot of places as well, uh, habitat restoration, where you have uh, a creek that gets turned into a ditch effectively and try to reactivate that space so it adds value to the community and hopefully then attract new investment. And it, but it's not for Terra coming in saying, this is what you're going to do. We come and say, all right, you've got this problem, it's been identified, we're now here to listen to how you, the community, want to address it. We can help you tweak that idea and then package it and go out and get funding to, to make it happen. Uh, so uh, it's certainly, it's never, it's more of an iterative process than it is for Terra coming and saying, this is what you're going to do and here's the money to do it. You know what I mean? All right, so I think we have the question here next and then I'll come back to you. Yes, my name is Beryl Fernandez. I'm an urban planning consultant of some 20 years here in Seattle, a PhD from the, urban, uh, from the Urban Planning Department, University of Washington, interdisciplinary actually. Um, my question is about how, how long can the architecture and urban planning professions continue, and engineering I should add in there, continue to, um, I think, detach ourselves from what's going on in our communities as a whole. And by that I mean, can we really say, look, we just take care of benches and transportation and the physical infrastructure and the sociological th things we're hearing about, that's, that's, that's their business, not ours. I've always thought of urban planning and, and, look, at, and look at the title, um, livability, alternative visions for livability. What makes an, an urban area livable for everyone? Now we talked about um, walking spaces. I looked at those and I thought, my God, some people in our community would be scared to walk down that space. It's not, and how can we make it so that it is safe for everyone? Um, we talked about, um, designing for elderly folk, which is great. How about also designing for other communities, taking that into consideration, making it that an integral part? Um, when we talk about civic engagement, we like to think we're really advanced by because we're going out and, and asking the community what they think. When are we going to make those people legitimate members of the architectural engineering and planning communities. They are paid staff on your staff, not just going out getting free advice from them. We've got to integrate this and we've got to win. I don't think we can continue. We're, we're go we've seen the, um, the anger of people. And, and so my question to you is, how do you plan to integrate these planning efforts? I'm going well, to ask like one or two responses okay. only because we have the lines sure. are getting so longer. So on, on the question of, and this is a really big deal on diversity in the architecture, landscape architecture, urban design and civil engineering and structural and you name it in that field. 
and I w I, I'm a hopeful person, but there is work being done there, and it has to start at the elementary school level. Um, it, it, so you have to expose people to that there is a job in this field. I, I'm, my family still doesn't know what I do. You know, not everybody is aware of this work. So you have to expose, and a good way to expose, and it ties to the earlier conversation, and, and kids are probably the best designers that we work with, is involve them, and they start to see that there are practices out there. But there are good programs being developed on that. I don't know why it's taken so long. I'm pushing 60 here, and I've, this conversation's been going on, but at least I'm seeing more direct work in that area. As, as far as the interaction of space, though, I think it's really important to, to note the reason it is important to get walkability is that when we are out walking our streets, whether downtown or in your neighborhood, we're a diverse society, and you are not in most, I know there's some, but most of our neighborhoods, including Aberdeen and Shelton, you are not gonna be able to walk a few blocks and not run up against somebody that doesn't dress differently, look differently, talk differently, eat differently. And so if we are out engaging, we'll get some of that roughness that you're talking about back in. But if we're in our cars, I mean, that's why transportation is important. We get on a bus, we're interacting with everybody. We're in a car, we're in interacting with the radio or whatever. So I think we're, make, we're making inroads, but we have to get people out of their comfort zone. And so it has to be comfortable to be out in public spaces. Um, and I kind of want to add to that. I mean, absolutely, diversity in the in these you know fields is important. But I don't really. I think obviously that's a piece. But I think in addition, it's how we value community members in public processes. I think so many people are devalued and made not to feel a part of, um, and truly are not a part of. Or like I said, or you know you're a part of for three open houses over a year process and that's the public engagement. Um, part of that is just because um, of resourcing issues and part of it is because the way we plan does not teach us to value the opinions of the public the whole way through in a really deep and substantive way and truly I don't know at least not in the States, I'm not sure of any planning schools that really teach that. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> My name is Mark, you met me earlier, and thank you for being here today for this <laughs> <clears throat> excellent presentation. But part of my job is going around bragging about this institution and one of the things I've been able to brag about this past year is uh, in January we were named one of the top 50 college going towns in America Tacoma was uh, and that's wonderful and if you go to that article uh, it talked about the diversity of college choices in this town but then the biggest thing it talked about was that term you have up there livability and I think you've all have mentioned that term in your presentations I know you did Peg and I think the rest of you have as well so my question is is there an industry standard for that term like that article kind of assumed that the people in Florida that were on the list and Oregon all those had the same uh, evaluation system or does every project start with you determining what livability means for that area and if it does how do you come to that big question well, people have been trying to develop metrics on that for some time now, and, and I don't think there's a universal, uh, there isn't a cookbook you can go to, certainly, or a standard book. But I think, in my, my view, what it comes down to is the more choices you have, the better. And that can be applied to anything, whether it's educational, transportation, public spaces, housing choices, the more, the better. The problem is, for the last 50 years, we've made fewer choices for people, fewer and fewer and fewer, to the point where just to pick one of those, housing, and we do it all the time in our language. We talk about single family and multiple family. There are only two choices of housing? How is that possible? How do we have two choices of housing? That's absurd. European folks don't talk about that. There are hundreds of choices of housing. 
They're all fine. They, we, we've, we've, cat, we've created a class system based on housing type. How in the world did we, did, we, did we manage that? We've got the good people living in the single family houses and the kind of suspicious people living in the <laughs> multiple family. They're always suspicious. They're always transient. They're transient, always yeah. criminals. They're always minorities. They're always poor. I mean, come on. That is just morally, ethically wrong. And we've got to knock it off. We can't do that anymore. Hi, panel. I'd like to preface my question with a comment about Peg said. I lived in, I lived in a neighborhood in Seattle that, as kids, we were able to uh, visit other you know, uh, residences and pick their fruit, and the, parent, and the homeowners didn't mind and stuff like that. And um, that's not like that anymore. And we played basketball with this person's house. I never even met the family, but it was safe. Nobody had problems and stuff like that. Nobody called the police or we didn't vandalize anything like that. that you know, that's not like it is today. But my question and mainly is to um, Mark and anybody else, how do we stop as citizens having a voice with what businesses go into our neighborhoods, not the whole downtown, but the neighborhoods, as two eateries in my neighborhood got you know, rented out and two banks went in? You know, can't do much with them when you want to eat. So. <laughs> right. Um, well, I was touching that a little, uh, on a little earlier. I have actually a third hat that I wear, which is I write for Crosscut, a magazine, which is a daily online journal of civics and politics and culture. And I've got a piece coming out shortly on just that subject of how do we re-nurture these, these kind of businesses that serve us on a daily basis, these small businesses. And I do think there are a variety of, of ways that we can do it without taking on some wholly new method. But we just have to be smart about it. And I've, I've sometimes said, which to the rage of people in the real estate industry, is that we've got communities now designed by brokers because they want to do one deal, they want to get their commission, and they want to leave. They're done. They're done with it. And we've got to stop that. They're, they're always going to go for the banks, because they pay the top dollar. They're always going to go for the chain stores, because they pay the top dollar. And we just got to, I, I've, I've sometimes toyed with the idea that we need to have a zoning regulation that says something like, I'm just making it up here, I know those people get, get annoyed, but, but just the idea that, Writing it down. No more than half of the frontage of any building on a on certain street can be larger than X number of square feet. We force the small retailing back into the equation. We make those brokers go for those little guys, not just for the big credit tenants. And we've got to reverse this. It's, it's, it's a scary proposition. Our places, like the, the image you had of going out of business, happening all the time. And, there's a variety of reasons for that, but I think we've got to take deliberate steps to reverse that attrition of small, homegrown, family-owned businesses that are the lifeblood of this culture. Okay. Uh, first, thank you, Ali, for bringing together this uh, great event, and then the, the panel, you all had enlightened me with uh, very uh, uh, useful presentations. Uh, when I think of uh, livability, uh, I, I know we talk about the neighborhoods, mid-sized city and, and, and all kinds of communities. But what comes to my mind also is urban living is become a very uh, sexy, almost, terms, a very useful, well, we want it to be in urban living because of all those things that you said, you make the, the city or the community that way. Uh, but I need all, all you uh, to think about or help, and actually the whole audience to help us to think about one other thing is that, because I, uh, have, even some of my colleagues have another uh, concept or terms that is very troublesome to me that we need to help, uh, help change. That term is urban education. Now, our university, as Mark said, I report to Mark, actually, I am with the campus here. So we're doing very well. We are urban serving. We are helping the city. At different, we are in, engaged in different communities, doing different things. Uh, but some people's notion of urban education is like students with poor grade, homeless students, and so on. By the way, we might actually, I heard that we even have homeless students on our campus that, that they study at UW Tacoma. Uh, that's a fact. So how do we deal with this kind of thing? We have to change the concept because when people think about, so I'm not just talking about 
higher education. Of course, not every city can afford to have a UW Tacoma, but not even a high school, but from the elementary school, homeschooling, but in particular, like daycares and so on. Maybe we don't need big daycares, but in places where people want to live, you want all walks of life, all the different generations, right? Uh, for more folks, you need a safe place for them. For kids, you need a safe place, but you need safe care, maybe a smaller one, but with good standard, good supervisions, and things like that. How do you planners and other folks help us to achieve that? So, uh, you know, it's interesting. That I don't know if you saw somewhere on the web, um, but that's whatever young child in Japan that took the subway, you know, and you're, you just, first of all, if you've been to Japan, you're like, holy cow, just like the number of people getting on it, you'd let that child go alone. Um, I don't know quite what the friction with our urban environment and education. We were just in this discussion with um, a young couple the other day that, um, is 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 think is wondering actually it was my book club um, so really where should they live because of education being in the city is it the right place to raise a child and you know this is this is a couple that has lived in D.C. San Francisco um, uh, Atlanta and and now Seattle so they're not naive urban li uh, and ur urban livers they're saying. I just don't know that I, I, I can afford a house and education for my child, and I'm worried about that. So we have, I, it's really economics. We've got to fund education. We're not funding it. And I mean, we're, this is not my area of expertise. Hopefully the next panel will be. But there is a funding issue in our society. We're, we're not respecting that. We also ha have to maintain our facilities. Now I'll get back into the design world. Our educational facilities that we send our children to, they are what they affect. They're, that's their image. And when our schools don't look good, and they don't, most don't, what are we telling our children when they're not swept at night, when they're not clean, if you go into the bathrooms and you know the outside isn't maintained, it's asphalt pavement, what are we telling our children? So we, we need to do both. We need to raise our children in the environment, and our children meaning all children, in the environment that we want to live in. We need to go a reverse empathy. Hi, I'm Lexi Brewer. I'm from FutureWise. Um, I wanted to circle back to affordability and push a little deeper. Um, so I saw those pictures of South Tacoma Way and I thought, holy cow, that's beautiful. But that also, too, you know, those sorts of streetscapes currently seem to be a bit of a marker of status um, for neighborhoods. And so bringing up the idea of displacement, you know, when you think of green infrastructure, these innovations, um, I think lessons abound of when things from the community's perspective have gone wrong. I'm thinking I lived in Detroit for a few years and the, re the revitalization, sorry, revitalization there has been lauded, but it's also four young white millennials from the suburbs who come into Detroit and use it as their plaything. Or if you think of even what's happening in Othello in Seattle, you have a lot of pushback from the community where it said, well, you said you did this for us, but it's not actually serving us. And I was thinking, you know, those markers of status, I don't think the answer is to not put these things into neighborhoods because you're nervous about it. But, you know, later on today, you mentioned we'll be talking about cultural institutions. If there are success stories or even ways to use cultural institutions to change that perception of the marker of status that you can think of and how you've been wrestling with that. I know it's a huge question, but something I think about a lot. Well, you know, I'm just going to take it on a personal basis on affordability in that um, I live within a block and a half of a rapid bus line, and I'm in a single family home, and I'm reading an article, and probably I will be upzoned. And I thought about it like, oh my goodness, I, I really didn't expect that to happen to me, to happen to our, our neighborhood. And, and then I thought about where I lived. I, I can walk to the grocery store. I can walk to a lot of those places. I think there's a, a doctor within a mile. You know, th there's a clinic. There's all these facilities. And 
we have to look to those places and say, we have to think about how we use our land appropriately. And it's, it is back to, it is back to choices. So I don't know how we, I don't know how we, I can't solve that affordability, but I do think we have to, we have to make it personal. So we have to think about our own space and what we need is space. Can we share a room? Could we handle living next to an apartment or one within three blocks? I mean, we just have to look at and take it personal of are we willing to interact with people that that don't live exactly like us because we can't be affordable and live the way we live if we don't it's not just density because you can I'm, I'm not saying don't have some uh, you know suburban style homes but don't have suburban style homes that don't that have to drive four or five ten miles to a grocery store we have to have at least ways for people to connect back in, give us choices. Uh, one, of the, one of the funny things that as I've done consulting work around the region, just like Peg has, there's a refrain that I hear at community after community after community, and that is, well, we already have our fair share of affordable housing. We don't want any more of that. We already have our share. Well, I guess then we don't really have a problem if everybody's got their fair share. Yeah. I mean, come on, that is not the case. Most communities absolutely do not, not even close. They just, they just, there's this rampant xenophobia afoot in this country. It's the fear of somebody different. And 1,400 again, people to stop it. signed up for 100 low-income housing units yesterday. 1,400. Yeah. So we have 15 minutes left. We want to. We want to answer going. that. Yeah. We're gonna go. Yeah, we want to keep We're going. We're not done. On that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and no, it's just an, it's such a huge topic, and I think it's I think it's probably the major failure um, between diversity and affordability. It's the major failure. I mean, I think someone earlier was asking for kind of exemplars, right? And I mean, you could say Portland's great, but they failed on affordability and diversity, just like yeah. a lot of wonderful places we like to visit. Austin's failed there too, right? And so, I mean. I think the interesting thing is a lot of the places that have this um, this market, it's market rate affordable housing, I think is what a lot of people are complaining about. You have this, you know, not very nice affordable housing that's not protected. That eventually is going to flip. So the more quote unquote successful you become, right, that housing will not, it's not protected and it will not stay affordable forever. And so frankly, decisions have to be made. Um, and I, I think Time and time again, um, people aren't making the decisions to protect affordability in time. And it literally can happen in like a year. Uh, I was living in Austin in 2003. By 2004, my rent had gone up 150%. The following year where I was living, it turned into condos, the whole neighborhood. Like it can happen really, really quickly. So if you are not planning to put affordability in place before you have started to get to the point where you're considering doing these streetscape improvement projects. If you're at that point, then you need to be locking in affordability. And people, people are terrified. People, we, like, I can't say affordability in the city I work in. Like, no, I'm serious because it's yeah. stigmatized. Yeah. Because I think part of the problem is, and this falls partially on designers, right, is a lot of the housing, is, it sucks. You know, a lot of the affordable housing <laughs> projects look like crap. And so you add that in, and then you add in the xenophobia, and people have a right kind of to be upset because you put in these horrible, low quality, mm -hmm. and so, and then not only that, but then when you do that, people don't respect it because they know it's garbage too. And so it's, it's complicated. Obviously, if anyone had the solution, we'd all be doing it. Um, but um, I, I really think it comes down to making the decisions to protect affordability before it's out of hand. And I just think everyone's behind the eight ball. Right. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. Uh, I, Lauren, and throughout, we've been, I, I, this has all been really great. Uh, you know, when I, I think of questions like this, you, uh, I, I work in communities, again, all across this region, and it feels like, it's, there's always this fear of asking for what it is you need or what you want. And, and it's true in Tacoma, it's true in Shelton, it's true in Aberdeen. 
And, and in some ways, it feels like those that, that say, well, we have the nice streetscape or you know, we have all this great infrastructure, we don't, we don't need any more. They're the ones that already felt empowered to ask. So I feel like that's a lot of what Forterra does. We come in and say, what is it you want? We listen and say, okay, well, here's how we can help you get maybe at least some of that, if not all of it, and help get them on that path. Uh, and, and, and Lauren has already kind of touched on this, this getting in front of the market piece. is Effectively, it's land banking, and it's a lot of what Forterra is doing right now, in fact. Uh, we're in the process of developing a, what we call a social impact fund to do exactly that. It's investing with the help of a community into property to then make sure it doesn't become your facade of banks, that it has good housing that's not, you know, 200% higher than what is there currently. So it's I have, it's really community driven, it's not Forterra driven. It's looking at a piece of property and say, we want it to provide these things for the community. And then we say, okay, well, we're gonna bank that, we're gonna hold on that. When the time comes to actually develop it, we're gonna do so in a way that it builds upon what the community has asked for, rather than just some you know, broker looking for his or her commission, right? It, it's, not, it's not what it's about, it's staying power. It's providing that ability for a community to decide for itself what it wants. Can I add one thing really quick? I promise I'll be quick. Um, talking about the affordability and keeping the small businesses in place, I think a big part of it is just interfacing with property owners. I mean, I can say in my situation, a lot of them are absentee. They don't live in that community. They don't even know what's going on. Um, and so a lot of them pick the banks just because it's the easiest thing, and that's who came and cool, let's just sign that lease. But a lot of them don't have any problem with putting in better businesses, but fr quite frankly, we have to do some of the work for them to you know, kind of make it so that they can't just default to the easy choice. But making, um, making the cities and the uh, communities hold uh, property owners accountable for those choices is really huge. All right, so we have time for a couple of questions. So, <clears throat> Michael. Um, my name is Michael Mira. Thank you, Ali, for convening us, and thank you for the panel for visiting with us. Um, I do have a question, but I first want to offer a view on, Lauren, your comment about affordable housing design. The other view of this recognizes that the aff affordable housing projects in the Puget Sound area by the nonprofit development community are some of the best designed and most environmentally responsible. This, this <laughs> Like what you do, Mark. Um, this is my question. It seems to me there's a cleavage in the literature, a tension in the discussion about urban design. I'd like your comments on it. On the one hand, it recognizes the value of planning and intention. And every one of the panel members have devoted their lives to the value of planning, and it results in some notable successes, like Yesler Terrace. The other view notes that planning have led to some of our worst urban blunders and instead is more of the Jane Jacobs view that urban communities should develop more organically without intention. Do you have a view about this? Am I right to understand this tension in the discussion? You know, I, I'm... Um it's interesting because I, I worked on the, the High Point project, which is a redevelopment of World War II housing, and I would say it was planning and intention. And, but one of the key things that I think made that, um, that neighborhood work well was the intention of not allowing one developer to come in. So. And that that costs the money. That costs them money. That costs profit. But it it's the hybrid of the of the Jane Jacobs organic approach. It's forced organic. It's you know rehab soil, if you will, or something. Because um, intentionally setting up different developers adds a little bit of friction when you're doing something all at once. And that's something we could pay more attention to. I mean, you see it, you know, in South Lake Union has a lot of develop, well, it doesn't really have a lot of developers. It appears to have a lot of developers. Um, 
and that it, it, it doesn't, I don't know, there's something wrong with the feel in that neighborhood. I'm not sure what it is, but it, it feels funny. I can't explain it yet. Uh, Mark, that's actually, for you. There's a, if, if you have an opportunity to ask this person to come down, I would rec highly recommend it. There's a wonderful, enlightened developer of the name of Liz Dunn, yes. who's been working on the Capitol Hill neighborhood. Yeah. So people know a fan base, therefore. Um, she has said one thing that just absolutely stands out to me. Stunning, a stunning thing. And we could do it. We could do it legally right now. She said no development should be more than a quarter of a block. Because even if you do it wrong, it probably won't harm anybody. <laughs> you don't notice how awful it is. But when something takes over an entire city block or half of a city block, almost no matter what you do, it's going to be kind of gross and crude. It may be too much of a good thing. I mean, there may be individual design aspects, but that's just too crude and crass a, a unit of building. And just something that simple. Can we have a provision that says maximum development size? Now, not everywhere. I mean, you wouldn't do that everywhere. But certain areas. Just you cannot do a huge project. And I think that one thing could make a difference. But Mark, I would argue that the correlation between big is highly synced with don't care, right? Or absentee yeah. <laughs> or commercial. Right. Right. So it's not the size as much as the people that are likely to be developing that probably are not invested in the community. And so I think on the organic piece, I think if people were invested in the community and cared about the community, you could count on that. But since most of the developers and most of the people buying up property, look at New York City, right? Look what's happened. The reason New York City is, part of the reason New York City is going the direction it is is because none of the people are invested in the community, right? And so I think forced organic. <laughs> so we're going to have short questions, short answers, so at least we get two more in. Let's see if we can do that. Right. Um, Lane Alfonso, so it is very complicated, and we we can tell that from the questions. The, the thing I'd like to offer or ask about is um, with affordability and livability, I think it's a job creation issue. So if you think about the idea of is there such thing as too dense? So if Seattle could actually spread those jobs out to Auburn, Tacoma, you know, we wouldn't have <laughs> as many people driving. But I guess the question, though, is, is you know, how do we create jobs in our spaces so that we don't have to get in our cars. And so this goes to Lauren, because that's a really difficult, complicated question, too. Why did you have to throw that one to me? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that's a great question. I certainly don't think Seattle jobs belong in Tacoma. I think Tacoma has to have its own jobs. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I think the only thing I can say about that kind of goes to what Mark was saying earlier, is sort of supporting the successes you have and creating um, a network to help hold up the businesses that are doing okay or doing well and kind of helping them stay in the communities long term. But beyond that, I don't know. I'll ask a really simple question. My name's Al Ratcliffe. I'm concerned about homelessness, uh, a very complex and growing problem. Uh, and my question is, can you uh, identify places in the nation or in the world where uh, efforts to reduce the uh, amount of homelessness have been effective and for which you have respect? Wow. Uh, it's a PhD question, so let's see who it is. I mean, I think a lot of it's cultural. I mean, so in the world, I mean, I think there's a lot of places in the world where people would never let, you know, their third cousin live on the streets. They're going to take that person in or, you know, their great niece's sister's friend is out on the street. They're going to take that person in. So, I mean, in the world, yes, there's lots of examples now. Here in the States, obviously, that is such a huge problem. I can't go to any public meeting or go to any business without hearing about homelessness. It is, it is so pervasive. It is completely out of control. Every jurisdiction has gotten caught with their pants down on this. It's, it's devastating. I mean, clearly it's, it's the great people just haven't recovered from the Great Recession. Um, and so I think now people are trying to play catch up. Um, we have a homelessness task force that is developing an action plan for this spring. Um, but frankly, to do things like permanent supportive housing and transitional housing, it's, it's just hugely expensive. Um, 
to do what really needs to be done. Now, mind you, it's not expensive stretched out over 10 years, but it's a huge initial capital outlay. And I think people are just struggling to figure out what to do. Part of it is job creation, so going back to that, but obviously creating that number of jobs for people who need additional support and care is, it's just really tough. Um, but obviously the onus is on communities and individuals and neighborhoods to start doing more, but um, I'm not gonna hold my breath on that one. You know, I'll step into this one. Um, I ride my bike to work and I think just like Lauren said with the Ford, with the, we were behind the eight ball on this and we were just not watching. I don't, um, it, it was happening and it wasn't, it didn't just happen. It was because on my route, seven and a half miles, I, I kept seeing more and more and more, and that wasn't like a weekend. It's, it wasn't like one weekend there was an, you know somebody and then suddenly, but on that seven and a half miles, there's probably only two miles that doesn't, didn't have someone living in a tent or something. So, you know, um, we, we really have to have affordable uh, wages. We have to pay, it really gets back to having some living wage jobs, and we're afraid of that. <laughs> and I, I was listening to Birmingham, I, I just heard this yesterday, and Birmingham, Passed, and this is in the South, okay? So they passed ten dollars an hour, and and the state of Alabama, and you know, for those of you who've been there, these are different places. And the state said, "No, Birmingham, you can't do that." Now, it's like, are they clueless that it does cost more to live in a city than it does to live in a tent outside? You know, so you can't just say the homeless. We have to have living wages. And yes, my husband and I got into this. We, all, we agree to disagree. But you're going, does that mean Seattle has living wages so we're going to get more homeless here? Well, you know what? I'd go the other way. We're going to set an example in, in our cities that care, in the Birmingham, in the Seattle. Does Tacoma, has Tacoma done this yet? You know, we're going to set wages. SeaTac, we're going to set wages and we're going to set an example and that will grow. And when we grow that, maybe we'll start to solve affordable housing because people that make a living wage, but here it would be $15 an hour if you're going to pay rent. In an, I mean, there are thresholds and we need to acknowledge that. Well, thank you very much. On that note, I think we are on time here, and you have about 10 minutes to get coffee and come back for the next session. I want to thank you all for the good questions and good conversation.